They say the most important component in creating a world-class fighter is world-class training. Save for those early days of the sport, you know, when you had bouncers, street tough guys, and traditional martial artists who had no versatility. You know, they could all get in the cage and just get embarrassed. And in this modern era, it is extremely rare to see someone grossly underqualified running a camp, uh, apart from Josh Fabia. So the doors that a fighter walks through every day is crucial to their success. Of course, when something changes in that routine, something changes in the cage. Sometimes we see an elevation in their game as new training opens doors that were previously closed. And sometimes we see an amazing fall from previous heights as the new coach or gym fails to push the athlete to those new limitations. What's up, fight fans? Tommy here. This is a unique one, Raid Shadow Legends. Now, I know what you're thinking, but hang on a damn minute. Raid couldn't come at a better time with the UFC shows drying up until next year. So why not kill some time and some epic dungeon bosses by getting stuck into Raid Shadow Legends with a new legendary champion based on MMA and pro wrestling legend Ronda Rousey. Yes, the Ronda Rousey. To celebrate Ronda's arrival in Raid, use the special promo code Raid Ronda to get a bunch of helpful stuff that will help level up your Ronda so she's at the top of her game. Just watch out for those head kicks. So how do you get Ronda? Well, she's free right now. Whether you're new or a longtime player, just log into Raid and play for seven days between now and February 28th and Ronda's yours. It's mobile and PC. It's free to download and play and we'll have you going five five minute rounds with multiple champions. Ronda's an absolute monster on the battlefield. She's got a bunch of multi-hit skills, making her perfect for taking on bosses like the Fire Knight. Better yet, her second skill blocks both active and passive skills, making her perfect for shutting down those super tough arena teams. Raid's got a huge new update, a brand new dungeon, and the introduction of Artifact Ascension. Also, if you are an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. And lastly, if you're a new player, be sure to scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack worth almost $30, a free champion Virgies, and this cool in-game loot. You will find your rewards in your inbox for the next 30 days. More information in the description below. I'm Bailey in from MMA On Point, and here are 10 times switching camps dramatically changed a fighter. Number 10, Travis Brown. When the Hawaiian native Travis Brown first stepped into the octagon, it was hard not to take notice. He was six foot six, a former college basketball player, and he made pretty quick work of the tough 10 standout James McSweeney, and then he got fast-tracked to a pay-per-view main card for his next three fights. That's not bad. Behind the KO power and agile footwork that betrayed his heavyweight frame was the daily instruction at two of MMA's most storied gyms, Alliance and Jackson Wink. Enter, though, Glendale Fight Club head coach Edmund Tarverdian. The former kickboxer was enjoying the fame that came with having star pupil Ronda Rousey, and several fighters, including Brown, decided to jump ship. Despite Edmund's claims that Brown entered his gym not knowing how to throw even a jab, the results of the change proved, well, otherwise, really. All the momentum he gained towards a shot at the belt transformed into alternating wins and losses until he got brutally stopped by Cain Velasquez at UFC 200, which kind of signaled an official downward spiral. By the time Brown wised up and changed camps again, he faced Derek Lewis at Fight Night 105, and the damage had kind of been done. But all's well that ends well, as the move to Glendale cemented his relationship with Rousey, who is his wife and mother to his daughter. Number 9. Mikey B or just Michael Bisping. It was a detached retina that made the Southern California Jason Perillo have to abandon his pro boxing career, and he smoothly made the transition into one of the best MMA coaches around. He got a lot of early recognition when he improved on BJ Penn's already elite boxing skills, and tons of other fighters began taking note and made the trip to Costa Mesa's RVCA gym to soak up some knowledge. Well, among those people who went to train with him was Ultimate Fighter winner Michael Bisping, and he was no slouch already in the striking department, but his ability to shift and adapt to the sweet science really changed his overall game. I just wish Rocky had learned that lesson, you know what I mean? I mean, he went on to absolutely destroy the former Strike Force champion Kung Lee, and that was due to his steady volume of accurate punch combinations and nuanced footwork. Kevin Bacon would be proud. The win over the GOAT candidate Anderson Silva can at least partially be credited to a nonsense approach of fundamental striking techniques, and his career-defining performance upset against Luke Rockhold to steal the middleweight title? Ha! <laughs> well, it was left at Larry, wasn't it? And who can we thank for that? No, not Larry. I don't know anyone named Larry. Jason Perillo. And yeah, Bisping did all this with one eye as well. So just like Jason, detached retina, they work together well. Number eight, the lioness, Amanda Nunes. 
for the longest time, the only person Amanda Nunes had lost to in the UFC was Kat Zingano. And it was after that loss that she left her gym MMA Masters and headed to Dan Lambert's storied American top team. With the famed Conan Silvera and the former WEC champ Mike Brown taking the lead for most of her preparations, Nunes ripped through the bantamweight division as a result, defeated the other featherweight GOAT and captured gold in two divisions. Come on now. She was then hailed as the best female to ever compete in the sport and strung together a dominant title defense streak. I mean, the move couldn't really have gone any better until the upset submission loss to Juliana Pena. The loss and thoughts of revenge sat heavy on her mind like the backstory to the Punisher. During this time, potential future opponents like Kayla Harrison and Yana Kunitskaya had made their way to Coconut Creek and Nunes felt it was becoming increasingly necessary to isolate her training from the rest of the team. So instead of continuing this awkward divide in camp, she decided to pick up her featherweight belt, call some old coaches and open her own facility solely dedicated for her own training camps. So far, the experiment was pretty damn fruitful as the immediate rematch kind of showed how much better she was than Pena. And once again, she's a double champ, so it's pretty hard to argue with that. Number seven, Robbie Lawler. Dana White referred to signing then 19-year-old Robbie Lawler as a birthday present to himself. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Oh, What did you get me, Dana? Just disappointment and tears. Anyway, the Pat Militage protege began his career with four straight first-round knockouts, and with his combination of heavy hands and wrestling credentials, it was, you know, pretty believable that he was going to be the future of the division. But things didn't go so smoothly. After lackluster results and stints in multiple promotions, Lawler, who by then was training at Arizona Combat Sports alongside Ryan Bader and Aaron Simpson, it was struggling to break through the top of the strike force middleweight division. You know, Lawler also learned that cardio was pretty important and he should probably work on that one. Pretty sure that's like rule one in Zombieland. But actually, Robbie had been undiagnosed with asthma and it had been exaggerated by the dry desert weather, so it was time for another change. He would pick the beach weather of South Florida and the American top team as his landing spot. When Zufa merged the strike force roster into the UFC, he would begin his path towards ultimate redemption. And upon returning to 170 pounds, he absolutely smashed everyone. The combination of humid weather, a fresh start, and a new haircut would lead to him bringing ATT its first UFC title belt. Lawler has since moved on from ATT, but it is without a doubt switching camps that led to his most impressive run. Number six, Frank Sham Rock. He's regarded as one of the original fighters to truly be a mixed martial artist. He began his journey as a student of his adoptive brother and UFC super fight champion Ken at the lion's den of all places. And no, that's not where they throw the Christians. Well, at least not anymore. They just give them to Derek Lewis. But a dispute with his brother motivated him to move away and start the alliance alongside kickboxer Murray Smith and judoka and submission specialist Suyoshi Kasaka. While fighters from different backgrounds had begun to prepare one another for the variety of combative challenges and MMA fight presented, this was the first camp dedicated to truly crafting well-rounded fighters. Shamrock, who had already won titles in Pancrase, would go on to author one of his best performances after the move. This would include winning the inaugural UFC light heavyweight title, beating Tito Ortiz and Jeremy in his four defenses, claiming the first WC light heavyweight title belt, and tripling down on the hardware by doing the same in Strikeforce middleweight. Come on now. That's basically like winning the Triwizard Tournament. Oh shit, that was lame. In addition, to establishing the blueprint for MMA super camps, his direct lineage has a tremendous impact on the sport. In addition to being a central part of BJ Penn's rise in the UFC and his work with Javier Mendez set the foundation for the American Kickboxing Academy, responsible for creating a long line of champions. He is the Sorcerer Supreme and the Alliance is his camotage. Number five, TJ Dillyshaw. When UFC vet Dwayne Ludwig took over coaching duties at Team Alpha Male, there was a clear difference in the cage, okay? The camp was home to standout fighters such as Joby Wan Kenobi, Chad Money Mendez, and of course founder and former WEC champion Liz Carmouche. Sorry, I mean your eye favor. My bad. The wrestling-centric group suddenly established itself as a collective with dangerous striking ability under the leadership of the new Muay Thai specialist. But it was TJ Dillashaw who benefited the most because he was probably part snake and he could move really well and shit, you know what I mean? And he did look like a completely different fighter and he snatched the bantamweight crown away from Hen and Barrow at 173. And we're all like, how did he do it? Oh, Dwayne Ludwig and magic peanut butter. That's how. So when Ludwig's plans to leave the Sacramento gym 
caused a rift between he and Faber, Dillashaw had a decision to make. He'd attempted to keep things cordial, fancy word, but after choosing to continue to train with Ludwig, Faber joined his corner in his first defense at UFC 177. But by the time Dillashaw would make his second defense, all appearances were dropped and traded for insults and sound bites. That's so, why you call them Killashaw? Yeah, Killashaw, Dillashank, like all that kind of stuff. Not even their shared dislike of Dominic Cruz could mend the broken fences. This ramped up ahead of his dual defeat of Alpha Male's second UFC champion, Cody Galbrand. How many times did I fuck you up in practice? Zero, motherfucker. Exactly. We're going to find hey, out. Saturday, you're going to find out. You can out. talk all you're you want, show your insecurity, show who you really are. It's We're going to get out there. I'm going to have a Dude, I had you face. into your own I'm going to break your ass. But Dwayne really was the PB to his J. Number four, the nightmare, Diego Sanchez. On the scale of poor coaching, there are those that just aren't good enough to handle the responsibility. I was telling him to keep his hands up. I, and heard, to, <laughs> I, I kept telling I him just here. to hit him. So. And those that are bloodsuckers, whose presence is actively harmful, like Count Dracula or your ex-wife. Sorry, sorry, my ex-wife. Consider Joshua Fabia the rare person who checks all the boxes. A bit like my ex-wife. I'm just kidding. As Sanchez's relevance in the MMA hierarchy was dwindling and the ultimate fighter winner found himself less of a priority at his longtime training home of Jackson Wing, MMA, the scam artist, let's call him, swooped in to capitalize on Sanchez at the low point in his life, which is by the book that, I mean, I will say that, that's by the book. He officially parted ways with the famed gym ahead of his UFC 239 bout with Michael Chiesa. Now, Sanchez would elect to solely rely on Fabia despite a lack of legitimate verified martial arts expertise. And you need that, do you, to start a gym? You actually need, okay. His lone cornerman, who doubled as his manager, screamed complete drivel and nonsensical bullshit as Chiesa effortlessly dominated for an entire 15 minutes. No more playing. You gotta go. 100, give it all. That's it. That's it. That's what it is. That's what you call non-advice. He was going 100. There's nothing you could say to him at this point. In their next outing together, an illegal knee awarded the unfortunate pair an unlikely victory, but Fabio would only turn that into a marketing opportunity for his school of self-defense and awareness. Oh, and his OnlyFans as well. Don't forget about that. This all accompanied the strange media tour and increasingly disturbing reports of financial scams and just reckless trading methods, okay? We've all seen the videos. I was on the first kindergarten rugby league in Christchurch, New Zealand. Fabia's antics would wear away at Diego's relationship with the UFC and the promotion eventually opted to release him just days before he was supposed to face his fellow Jackson Wink alum, Cowboy Cerrone. Soon after that, Sanchez would see the light though and cut ties with Fabia and in typical goofball fashion, he would act like a total bozo after the split. A bit like my ex-wife. Number three, Charles Oliveira. Prior to the run that prompted many to hail Charles Oliveira as one of the best lightweights in UFC history, his reputation was much less revered, let's say. While he was no stranger to an exciting fight, as his then nine post-fight bonuses would indicate, he was also wildly inconsistent. Between a bad track record and the scale at featherweight and his puzzling habit of getting submitted, betraying his high level of jiu-jitsu, which just made no sense, there was no telling what the final product would be once the opening bell rang. But that would change in 2018 when Dubronx would make his way over to Shoot the Box Academy. The same team that had shaped the early careers of Shogun Hua, Anderson Silva, Vanderlei Silva, and Chris Cyborg. Just like it says on the back of John Jones's favorite gas station dick pill, the results were almost immediate. Oliveira would transform from a dangerous grappler who could be a liability on the feet to a well-rounded threat with power and diverse striking skills to match his aggressive submission prowess. Dubronx would then do what De Niro and Taxi Driver did to the whole 155 division and burnt the whole thing to the ground, distancing himself completely from the gatekeeper's status that his previous efforts had earned him. In one of the most exciting fights for 2021, he finished former Bellator champ Mike Chandler to win the UFC lightweight title and successfully defended it, equally entertaining and impressive along the way. Smashed it, mate. Number two, Francis Ngannou. After leaving his native Cameroon, hoping to begin a pro boxing career and it led him to France, coach Fernand Lopez would convince Francis Ngannou to give MMA a try. And as a member of the Lopez Paris-based MMA factory, Ngannou quickly stood out on the regional scene and found himself debuting in the UFC just six fights into his career. His freakish knockout power would instantly turn heads, both figuratively and literally, leading to a chance to face Stipe Miocic for the title at 220. By then, he was already spending part of his time in Vegas at the presence of well-respected extreme control 
Montreal striking coach Dewey Cooper and he's in his corner for that fight. But after losing that decision and a second one after that to Derek Lewis, a growing rift between he and Lopez became too big to ignore and Ngannou made the full-time move with Eric Nixick and Cooper at the wheel. He would then continue to impress with a string of first round stoppages before meeting Miocic again at UFC 260 for a second chance at gold. It seemed like they plugged him into the bloody matrix and he downloaded the MMA playbook because he absolutely dismantled Stipe in every aspect of the sport. Ngannou would then rub salt in the wound of Lopez with a successful defense against former training partner Cyril Garn. Once again, he surprised everyone as he out-wrestled Garn over the distance. Number one, Kamaru Usman. Okay, let's face it. If you saw Kamaru Usman's rise to the top of the welterweight division, it wasn't exactly known for excitement and displays of advanced striking acumen. I mean, I fell asleep most of the time. Okay, there was that lone knockout victory over Sergio Marais, and to be honest, he looked fantastic, but Usman's path was defined by two things, superior wrestling and more cardio than Austin Powers. Most of you will remember his misinterpreted 30% remarks after defeating Emil Meek. I mean, the fight itself wasn't that impressive, so I doubt you remember that. In his first defense at UFC 245 though, he and fellow collegiate wrestling champion Colby Covington would forget their base discipline and elect to trade, and that led to a KO win for Usman, and that was pretty damn exciting. But when the fellow Sanford MMA welterweight and close friend Gilbert Burns was scheduled to challenge for the strap at 251, instead of dividing the gym, Usman elected to head to Colorado and enlist the services of Major Trevor Whitman. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see much of his new striking skills that camp, as the opponent was switched to Jorge Masvidal at the last moment. But at UFC 258, he fought Gilbert, and in a wild fight, his frightening new power jab led him to a third round knockout. That jab became a staple of the rest of his career, along with the other improvements in his striking, where he went from a boring wrestler to just a freaking KO artist. Trevor went on to get coach of the year, and although Usman had already completed the welterweight division, he basically went to New Game Plus. Shout out to the return of the Mac, Anthony Walker, who's back writing some scripts for us. He wrote this one, and I pretended to read it whilst making everything else up. Go check him out at Ant Walker if you want to show some respect. Wouldn't catch the editor of this video, Luke Taylor, switching teams, okay? He's MMA OP for life, son. Give him some support and follow him at call to me underscore. Oh, Benny, thank you for making us musics that go in the intro, Ben Rossetti. I've definitely run out of ways to shout you out. So enjoy this song. And I guess that's it. But thanks for the intro as always, mate. Okay, I'm done being stupid now. This was an interesting video, to be fair. What did you think? Comment below and click the thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Sub if you want more. I've been Bailey and I'll see you in the next one.